Welcome to uh, North Coast Angel Fund's Angel 101, sponsored by PNC. We are thrilled to have everyone here tonight. As many of you know, this is an event for members of the Angel Fund, for active angel investors who are not part of the fund, and also for people who are new and considering the activity. So a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, we're hopeful to hear from many of you in the Q&A and uh, afterwards. And please feel free to engage with uh, the panelists who come from a wide variety of backgrounds, from founders and investors to uh, people with deep industry expertise in many of the areas that uh, we invest. Before we dive in, wanted to do three quick things. One is just to express our gratitude to PNC for uh, sponsoring us here tonight, not just for the Angel 101. Yes, thank you. but also for supporting the Angel Education Series for the balance of the year. On uh, your tables, you will see calendars of these particular events. After the 101, we start to dive into some uh, deeper areas where we'll talk about, essentially, what makes up a high potential company. This is aspects of filtering opportunities, diligencing opportunities, not just at the early stage, but also as we grow these companies and consider them for follow-on uh, investing, attempting to optimize returns. So this is efficient fundraising, uh, driving growth in these companies, and also building relationships so that there will be M&A and potentially IPO opportunities in those rare cases where uh, the market and the window cooperates. We'll also have a final capstone of sorts, which is CEO Insights, where we're going to have quick hits from a number of successful CEOs in town, successful investors, VCs, private equity firms, and trying to uh, really bring together some of the things that we've talked about uh, for the balance. So we uh, thank PNC once again, that's number one. Number two, despite the uh, great support from PNC, this event is not free in that we are asking that everyone complete a survey uh, before leaving. It is a one-page survey, relatively painless, but I would assure you that we read every survey and uh, include the feedback as we think about new sessions. So please complete that, and your reward for staying, completing the survey, and being around for a drawing is eligibility in our door prize, which for those of you who've attended these before, know that the North Coast Door Prize is always a bottle of Angel's Envy uh, Kentucky bourbon. And this is has become the official bourbon of angel investors everywhere, or at least in Northeast Ohio. And uh, we look forward to handing that out later uh, tonight. Before we go forward, we want to remind people of the dates uh, here later this year. We hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, and also want to give a moment for uh, John Beer from PNC just to give a brief welcome to the group to uh, acknowledge his team and then we'll dive right in. John? Thanks, Dad. All right, so this is our 30-minute uh, uh, commercial that we're going to give. <laughs> Come on, a little bit more now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll be here all night. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you to Todd. Uh, and his team for uh, uh, introducing us to this opportunity. So uh, I'm sure you know, you may be wondering why is PNC Wise a bank up here sponsoring an angel investing uh, event. And you know we uh, sponsor a lot of organizations from a cultural standpoint, but we also look for opportunities uh, where we can help uh, the local economy grow. That's uh, obviously a huge benefit for us and for all, for all of us that live in Northeast Ohio. Uh, so we heard about this opportunity. We were excited to, to partner with Todd and uh, North Coast Angel. Uh, and as, he's, as Todd mentioned, we're, this is for the whole series, so we're excited about, uh, about being a part of it. Um, so my quick little commercial is, uh, I, uh, I'm John Beer, I run the uh, managing, I'm managing director for the Wealth Management Group here in Cleveland, uh, and we typically, we work with clients that uh, uh, have typically about a million dollars or more of investable assets. We also have a Hawthorne Group. We don't have anybody here tonight uh, from that group, but several of my colleagues are here tonight, so hopefully we get a chance to meet you. I also want to recognize Pat Pastore, who's in the back, who's our regional president. And so we're excited to be here, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Todd. Sure, thank you. I kept it short. 
All right, so a brief roadmap for tonight. There's going to be about 15 minutes up front of angel investing overview. The idea here is to get on the same page before diving into panels on diligence, deal terms, and valuations, and then helping companies be successful. High level, the who, the what, the where, the why. So the who is us. We're specifically talking about individual angel investing opportunities. It's going to be uh, different at different stages and in different industries. The what tends to be technology-oriented companies, software, life sciences, electronics, controls. These are typically venture path companies where there is the ability to leverage a relatively small amount of capital to demonstrate a hypothesis and then to scale around that capital. The where is Northeast Ohio, Ohio, the Midwest. The reason we differentiate that is because depending on the base of talent, the base of resources, and the base of capital, there are gonna be different options available to grow and scale different ideas. We don't think it's a completely different playbook being in Cleveland than another city like Pittsburgh or Columbus or Cincinnati, but we think it's a different playbook than you tend to see on the coast. The when is seed stage. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but there are different stages where we think it makes sense for individual angels to get involved and take advantage of where we can have an impact. It's typically post friends and family, so it's not ideas. There's a product, there's a small team, there's something that's been demonstrated, but it's pre-scale. These companies haven't received institutional venture capital. They typically don't have two or five or $10 million of revenue. Typically, they're at that crucial point of demonstrating something. The why uh, has, has to do with a couple things. The first is why angel invest, right? And it's a couple things. One, make money. If we don't think we're being successful, there are probably better things to do on a Wednesday night. Number two is to have fun. You know, this is in, uh, inherently a collaborative activity. There's a lot of uh, intellectual curiosity that we all satisfy by learning about new technologies, by getting engaged in growing companies. And it's also a way to contribute to the region by growing great companies. It's more fun, candidly, to see a success in a company like Onshift, which gets up to 250 people, has over $30 million in revenue, than it is just to invest in, say, a Netflix at the right time. It, it can be very rewarding. So that's the why as far as why angel invest. The why as far as why we're here, why put on angel education. Well, you've all heard of the idea practice makes perfect. It's not true, <laughs> right? Practice just makes practice. Uh, I think one of the things that we found after 12 years of doing this is that unless you're really intentional, unless you learn from your own experience, you learn from others' experience, that includes our mistakes and other mistakes, you're, you really should not have a higher expectation of success. What we do is inherently very challenging. We expect a majority of the opportunities to not be successful the way we might envision. When we lose in a deal, we expect to lose all of our capital. So it means that where we have opportunities to learn and improve our outcomes around better deal sourcing, better screening, better diligence, better actual investing, and doing a better job helping companies grow and be successful, we think we have the ability to uh, move the needle. And we'd like to impact that, not just within our group, but in the larger early stage investing ecosystem. You can see this slide here, it's showing the capital continuum. And we just do this to highlight what seed stage investing uh, really is. It is before product market fit, typically, uh, but it is after company formation, after MVP, after concept uh, introduction. And the seed stage really will matter here. I don't know how many of you have heard uh, startup is not a smaller version of a larger company. This is really true. For example, you don't just have uh, a regular doctor look at a baby and say, it's just a small person, right? We'll treat it like a small person. These startups are really different, and this skill set, this background, is something that uh, we're trying to breed more familiarity with. A little more context on seed stage and the risk factors here. Uh, this is data that comes from CB Insights, and basically just shows that most stages of development from one round to the next, the good half of the companies go away. And so it means that for us to be successful as individual investors, we have to invest in enough companies, a large enough portfolio, where we can get past some of the core diversification issues that have to do with lucky and unlucky outcomes, that have to do with what's happening in a specific industry, in a specific geography. 
This is additional CV Insights data, which is surveys from failed companies and capturing why those businesses fail. Top three, no market need, ran out of cash, not the right team. Those are things we as angel investors should have something to say about, right? Those are things we should be evaluating up front, evaluating on a regular basis uh, and a board or observer engagement, and also attempting to mitigate uh, through involvement with the companies. General outcomes of what can happen with a business. It can either be successful for the entrepreneur or a failure for the entrepreneur. It can be successful for early stage investor or a failure for the early stage investor. Those successes and failures do not always align, sometimes due to timing, sometimes due to terms, sometimes due to just core developments within the business. So it's important that we are driving success and trying to help a company be successful, but also looking out for our own interests as investors and making sure that we protect ourselves as we invest. And that's a little bit what we'll talk about in deal terms later. So high risk, high reward. If you can't see the caption at the bottom, it says if we pull this off, we eat like kings, right? So this is the big win. Not every swing that angel investors take has to be a home run, but typically if the upside of an opportunity is only a 2X or a 3X or a 4X, it probably isn't worth the inherent risk that's there. So we wanna be making sure as we diligence companies and as we get to know opportunities that we're asking the question in diligence, does this have the ability to be an outsized win? Could this be a really substantive outcome that justifies our time, energy, and risk capital? Brief background on uh, North Coast. North Coast is made up of three separate angel funds, almost $25 million uh, under management across those funds, over 200 individuals who engage with us. So those are people who show up at meetings like this, who help bring deals to us, who invest individually in these companies, and in many cases, attempt to help the companies be successful, either through commercial introductions, uh, capital introductions, helping them grow sales, marketing, and lending either industry expertise or functional expertise. The active membership model is really what defines an angel group, and thus far we've invested in 53 companies. But an important thing uh, we think to know about uh, groups like North Coast are that we don't operate in a vacuum. You know, we are part of a region, part of a geography, and we morph to the particular needs of the region and geography, and we partner with the other players here in the geography. So we work very closely with Jumpstart in terms of identifying opportunities, sourcing deals, co-investing together. A flash starts, which is an accelerator in town, at the very early stages, because the companies that go through that accelerator are all candidates to work with uh, our group. And then, of course, building relationships with institutional venture capital funds so that once our companies grow and are successful, we help to create bridges so there are relationships so that the companies can raise more capital. That said, it is difficult. There are a lot of reasons that companies can and do fail. Uh, it's important to talk about the failures, the reasons why companies fail, and again, to mitigate against them because these terrific opportunities in the market are not always as powerful and salient as we think. The solutions that are brought by an individual entrepreneur are not always uh, as powerful and impactful in the market. The customers who appear to be drooling over a solution aren't always as willing to roll up their sleeves and get involved, aren't always as willing to write uh, an early stage check. Sometimes the competition isn't as slow as we like to think they are. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to team. Uh, we're placing a bet on a handful of early stage entrepreneurs, a big bet on the CEO, and it you know, brings us to the, the classic uh, debate of horse versus jockey, right? Which is if you could only pick one, would you pick a terrific horse, a great industry, a great market, or would you pick the great jockey, a terrific operator? Most people would err on the side of the jockey. All things being, things being equal, you'd love to have both. In reality, in non-coastal regions, you make compromises around each, right? We don't have a lot of three times successful entrepreneurs. We do have some. We also don't have a, a lot of opportunities where the, the, the business proposition the CEO is going after is a billion dollar or a $10 billion market. So it's up to us and up to individual investors to try to think about where there are matches, what entrepreneurs we can bet on, and where we can help entrepreneurs build the right teams. 
So as we evaluate people and evaluate teams, I think we'll get to some of this in the Q&A with the panels, but evaluating human beings in general is very hard. Entrepreneur, uh, evaluating entrepreneurs who are salespeople, who have a lot of enthusiasm and are telling a story, is even harder, right? We want to be optimistic. We don't want to be uh, pessimistic or skeptic, uh, skeptical. But you have to ask the, the hard questions to get past some of the inherent biases that a CEO may have. Most CEOs don't appreciate that the broader uh, continuum applies to their company, right? Most companies will fail, but mine probably won't. It's really hard to raise capital, but we'll be successful. So it's not our job to uh, rain on anyone's parade. We don't want the, the, the CEOs to have less optimism. We really just want them to benefit from building relationships with other CEOs, other investors, who can help them understand what it takes at each level to be successful, and then to increase their odds of winning. So if anyone here has been pitched an early stage opportunity, I'm guessing you've seen something like this. We probably have thousands of these in our uh, inboxes. This is what every vision looks like. And I don't know about all of you, I've never seen one happen in reality, even on the most successful companies that we've seen. Uh, Onshift, terrific company I mentioned, it wasn't this kind of hockey stick. The Surex, which got up above $100 million in revenue, certainly wasn't a nice, consistent hockey stick. They get there over time, but they get there by learning, testing the market, growing, and then putting more capital to work. So again, it's not to say, let's throw all, the, all this out and not think about it, but as we're in diligence and as we're working with uh, entrepreneurs, it's important to make sure we understand and they understand the actual activity and assumptions that are behind some of these numbers and understanding from a pressure testing perspective, what's realistic, what could we potentially bet on, and if things go right, what can we expect? But it's, it's rarely a hockey stick. This is from the Angel Resource Institute and provides some outcome data. What it shows here is that the overwhelming majority of opportunities, not surprising, provide 1x, so your money back, or less. Right? A smaller and smaller number and percentage of outcomes tend to be in the 10x, 20x, 30x variety. The good news is, though, you can only lose all your money once. Right? If you invest a <laughs> invest million dollars in a deal, you can't lose that million dollars two times, or three times, or four times. And in the positive outcomes, you can make your money back uh, meaningfully, and even though we're early in the North Coast experiment, we've had multiple 4Xs and 5Xs and a 7X uh, with our opportunity with Onshift, and we think we have several larger opportunities that uh, are there. And once you start to get more uh, returns in the 7X, 10X, you, you may find some that are a 20X, a 30X, or much higher, and that really drives your uh, portfolio. But what's encouraged us is uh, seeing a significant number of opportunities for those 5Xs, 8Xs, because what it tells us is that there are entrepreneurs here in Cleveland we can bet on and structures we can put together around them to help them be successful. So common sense diligence approach. Uh, even though we're going to talk about diligence, I wanted to go through just the, the real basics here. The biggest thing we look for uh, in general is a market. Is the market big enough? Is it growing fast enough? Is it intriguing enough to allow a new entrant to come in and really make noise? When we circle up what are the biggest filters we look at, market size is really the biggest. Credible solution means can we buy what the entrepreneur is selling? It doesn't mean that we're doing a code review at the beginning. It doesn't mean that they have to have the best product in the world. Just that is it viable that they could address this big solution? It's never gonna be perfect early on. But as we filter opportunities early, we at least want to make sure that there's a credible thesis for why this entrepreneur, and then in down here in good hands, this team can address the market uh, and ultimately win. Getting to things like IP, getting to things like profitability, it's not that we uh, ignore that at the early, early stage of diligence. We don't ignore it, but we can't pass go unless you've got a big market and a great team. So that tends to be where we focus on early diligence and then start to dig deeper into these other areas. So this is not how deals are done. I, how many Shark Tank watchers do we have? Okay, so more, more than a few. Uh, I think, I just don't watch it because it's depressing. <laughs> uh, but it, it is entertaining, and what's, what's interesting is certain aspects of it are absolutely true, right? The, 
reality of people making their best guesses at a, mm -hmm. at a time, seeing a passion entrepreneur kind of put their idea out there. What's not realistic is coming to these short decisions, right? Uh, having confidence in a nice suit and then making it work after that, right? There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in most of the opportunities that we invest in. If they're successful, we'll take five to seven years or longer to ultimately win. So with that, why become an angel, right? I've probably done a bad job so far because I've told you that it's really hard, you'll lose your money most of the time, and it takes five to seven years to win. So the reason people do this is to learn, to meet great people, to enjoy the activity, yes, to have a return, and, and to give back and to engage in this. And I think that's part of the uh, passion and interest you'll hear from a lot of uh, our panels coming up. So I'll take a moment to see if there are any questions before we invite our first panel. But if not, we'll bring the group up and we'll start to talk about diligence. Please join us. So we have one light to pass, and we have one that is intended to try our best here. And we'll start just with a uh, brief introduction of uh, brief panelists. Then I'll ask a few questions, and then I hope we'll have questions from the group. My name is Michal Sokolov. I am a principal at Matrix Equities, where we focus on uh, private equity investment in technology, real estate, and natural resources. I focus on the technology side. My background is in software development and engineering. I've worked in uh, spoken language systems, AI, machine learning, all, all the current buzzwords before they were buzzwords. And I've worked for many years both in research institutions, large corporations, as well as startups. Yes, hi, I'm Lou Story. Um, I'm pretty much retired today. I um, spent many years of my life in sales and general management and capital equipment. I was the CEO of Matran for more than 20 years. Um, on retirement, I taught in the science and technology entrepreneurship program at Pace for seven and a half years. An angel investor was, and I started doing that, so I needed to call play and uh, for 10 years ago. Uh, I, I, I'm in a long suffering startup company as well. Yeah, and uh, I've been on the screening committee for over 10 years, and I'm also on the screening committee at the live. I'm Daniel Luketic, so I'm the director of North Coast Angel Fund. Uh, I quarterback, uh, one of my responsibilities is quarterbacking a number of companies through our diligence process. I joined Fund 3 about, or North Coast Angel Fund about three years ago as we were launching our third angel fund. Uh, my entire career has been working in startup technology companies, uh, ranging from the education industry to crowdfunding insurance industry, as well as companies that are going through the fundraising process, that are going through the process of building out their teams, building out their products, and bringing those to market. Terrific. One works as well. Bruce, we'll, we'll start with you. You mentioned Glide, which is an organization uh, I did not allude to when we talked about the ecosystem, but it's very important to know what it does and how early it operates. Can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. So, uh, Glide is the Great Lakes Innovation Development Enterprise. It was uh, based at the Maine County Community College. Uh, we started that here years ago. And I think it's uh, one of the first stops in the three C uh, world. Uh, there are two, um, two, two grants or, or awards that Glide and the A grant. $25,000 that has to match, and there's a e grant with $100,000 which has to match. And uh, I think a great deal of uh, Northeast Ohio startup companies come through the glide process and I think they do a great job with their first call team. And uh, they, they have to talk to everybody, so these two companies are you know, pretty interesting. 
Michael, uh, why the side of where else do you find companies to search, whether it's here in the region or outside the region? How are you finding companies that are worth the time and energy uh, to, to get to and get to know? So I think there's a few areas that um, we found as source. Some are really friends and family. It's what Todd mentioned at the beginning, that people use for investment. But in word of mouth, people get to know that you're involved, you're interested, you're an investor. And we get to see a lot of opportunities that way. I think as a fund, we see a lot of opportunities with our work with Jumpstart. Uh, we do a lot together. A lot of flash starts, which is an accelerator. Um, that's been here in Cleveland for quite a few years. We get a lot of very good quality companies coming from there. And the third avenue that I personally see and now I'm looking to bring into this environment is overseas. So um, we're involved with Israeli companies and Israeli startups. And there's an incubator we've been working with called eHealth that does a lot of digital health that is a partner with the Cleveland Clinic. And we recently brought them in to talk to us about a potential pipeline of work. So I think it's both local, domestic, and international as well. Go down to the end with Daniel here. So Daniel, what is the sweet spot in your mind? So you've probably seen 500 companies over the last three years, maybe more. What's the sweet spot for what angels should consider here at Northeast Ohio? Yes, yeah, so I, I think your slide did a pretty good job, right, of, of generally putting us in the bucket of seed stage. So technology enabled, the seed stage, so companies that um, there's an MVP hopefully in market in the hands of some customers and some early revenue streaming in. Uh, companies that have a few founders, maybe a few initial uh, full-time team members there at the table. There's a little bit of investment that has come in from friends and family of maybe a few individual angels, um, but they're now approaching us at the stage when they're putting together a $500,000 to $2 million um, investment round and fundraise. So, that is for a stage, but to put a finer point on it, if you look across funds one, two, and three, largest portion of our portfolio is focusing on business to business, B2B, software as a service, SaaS companies, uh, companies where we can go out there in the diligence process and talk to existing customers, relatively small, small expense to developing the software, makes them very agile to be able to pivot and adjust uh, to market needs and what they're hearing as they develop, uh, good exit multiples. Um, so business business software as a service, but then also industry focus. I think we found a sweet spot over the years, and especially with Fund 3 on looking to leverage regional strengths, which just so happen to be many of our membership strengths. We're made up of 200 angel investors that come out of the largest institutions here in town, so that gives us strength across healthcare, insurance, banking, manufacturing, marketing, um, and so we try to specifically uh, focus on companies where we can leverage that. Uh, Michal, maybe paint a picture as to what diligence on an early stage company looks like, because for people in the corporate environment who diligence and acquisition, for example, there may be days or weeks spent interrogating a model, right? And for an early stage company, the model might be 25 cents on the assumption of what a market would look like. How do you, what's it look like? So I think it's a little bit of process and a little bit of magic. Um, the process is to try and formulize a way to look at companies and to normalize across a large range of industries. It's because we see so many ideas in so many areas, you want a yardstick that can tell you, is this idea better than that? Will this have more success for, or chance for success? So in order to do that, um, we've developed a process and tried to keep it also not too arduous and not too long. One of the issues is as a company's going through a fundraising, they're going through diligence with multiple funds, individuals, and venues, and you can wear them out. The CEO especially can spend most of their time in this due diligence and not be able to get the company going forward. So specifically in North Coast, we've tried to cut that down to 30 days. We have a team that uh, gets put together usually through a team committee, and in that case, it's usually six to eight people. We try to include a subject matter expert, at least one, and people that have been involved in that field of, of interest. 
We really focus on multiple areas. As Tom mentioned, product market fit is one of them. Another one is the vision for the company, meaning in some areas, you're really trying to find a company that does have the fit but in a very, very small percentage, and I'm talking less than a handful, what you really want to see is the company that doesn't have a fit yet, because what they've done is shift a paradigm. Meaning, if you think of Apple, any of the fake companies, why they are the top five is because they changed the model. And so you want your diligence process to be able to identify, hopefully we get at least one here in Cleveland, but along the greatest one. So the actual process, they come in, it's a 30-day period. We have an initial due diligence meeting of two hours with the CEO of the company, usually a CTO or a technical person presents. We then follow up with questions with multiple follow-on um, phone calls within the diligence committee. And then we have a vote within the month whether to bring it to the membership model. Uh, a few caveats on that. Sometimes the company is just not ready. Great idea, we like the team, but we need to see a strategic partner, we need to see a potential customer, we need to make sure that they are raising enough money because the runway, as we call it, needs to be long enough to let them survive, long enough to prove what they want to do. So that's the part that's a little bit of process. The little bit of magic is you hope you find that spark, that one in a million or probably five in a billion that have become those companies. And that's where you need to step outside the more organized model and really give a chance to see, have they thought of something we haven't yet? Are they holding the iPod? Are they redefining how retail occurs online? How are they redefining social networks um, and such? So it's a little bit of both. Great. So Bruce, what do you see as the red flags of the diligence? What tells you to stop? I'm, uh, I'm kind of biased towards uh, whether I think the founders uh, can take this with a chance or not from a business point of view. And particularly, um, quoting uh, the great Steve Blank again, uh, if, uh, if the founders uh, can't sell, they're going to be horrible entrepreneurs. And uh, I find so many situations. It's one of the reasons we, quite frankly, can't just receive a diligence folder, do our evaluation, and come to a conclusion as a team. It's the reason we've got a two, three-hour kickoff and a series of follow-up because we want to engage with the entrepreneur. We want to understand what makes them tick, how they think about the assumptions in their model, and, and, and really understand their background and their vision for the business. This is a, they are the captain of this boat, and it's a, it's a, going to be a long and very difficult uh, path journey, um, it's a very, very tough thing to do. And so some traits, I guess, in addition to being able to sell that I think is are a couple just of a, of a long list of traits that we'll look for. One is their ability to listen. So listening to customers, listening to the market, listening to potential investors, listening to their team, just listening across the board and being able to adapt, adjust, plan, pivot where necessary. Uh, quickly is, is a key trait. Another um, key trait is the ability to attract top talent. I would just say, even at the stage when there's not a very large team and they're approaching us, there's a lot you can tell from seeing the founding team members, the advisors, potentially additional investors that are already part of the round, um, because it's just gonna be so critical for them to be able to attract that top talent to build a successful business long term. So, just a couple. So we'll have a couple of lightning round questions and then we'll look to questions from the audience. On a scale of one to 10, how important is IP patents? 
eight. Because I'm just eight. I would, I would agree. I would just add uh, maybe more important for life science companies, I think, that when we're reviewing life science versus software. Most common or most egregious mistake that entrepreneurs tend to make when pitching. And my favorite is uh, quoting the uh, size of the market from the economist. So, uh, and then you only get 1% of the percent of the all the years or from the company. Saying they use machine learning and artificial intelligence, not realizing that I'm in the room, and I'm going to call them out on it. <laughs> Just not spending enough slides in their presentation deck on the problem and their mastery of the problem and the, the existing solutions they're trying to solve that problem today and not very sufficient. Most memorable idea you ever been presented? So not idea, um, but just pitch in general. We do a, we, we we hear a lot of pitches just so we can see a larger volume via video conference and. Uh, there's just a couple that stand out in my mind where we had a nice angle up their nose or a window in the background so you have the silhouette of the person and it's basically witness protection uh, type of conversation you're having. Those are always enjoyable. I'm going to say ask me in 10 years because the most memorable one is going to be the most successful. I need about 10 years to give you that one. <laughs> Very true. Questions from the audience? No. Yeah, a real quick one. Bruce mentioned just that quick point there about uh, the market size. This is a great one. So as we're looking at that, uh, how's the right way to think about the appropriate market and the appropriate market size? Again, you can add going after the world and you know, $2 trillion. But what's really the true definition and how do we work to define that? I like to see uh, sort of a bottom-up micro projection of what they think their current team should be because the North is so high. And then you can take those numbers. There's some pretty decent government statistics that you know, possibly blow them up. And uh, I think that works pretty well. So uh, that makes them really do their homework. If it's life sciences, it gets a little team of the screening committee team and from that the diligence teams are put together and selected we do bring in the subject matter experts if it's outside our field we also will bring in people in the industry and their actual potential customers so if a company is claiming to be able to sell into a certain industry we will go out and ask and talk to people in that industry if they have reference accounts which is hard to get for a brand new company but if they claim one, we'll follow up um, on that as well. So that's in North Coast, but I'll step outside that for one second because Lynn Ann is here and she'll be speaking later and um, she's run a more informal women's angel network that I go to as well where companies present um, in a quick form and then we do our own due diligence. So when you're doing it by yourself, you can be at a little bit of a disadvantage because you don't have that team. And in that case, you really do have to go out and get other people um, to answer your questions if that is outside your field of reference. One more question. Eric? This isn't a question, I just uh, comment. Entrepreneurs listen. They don't 
countless blocks. That's a very good point. I mean, it's one that we are seeing and have seen, and we really evaluate based on if they are coachable, if they listen. Uh, one of the most dangerous characteristics to an entrepreneur is arrogance. They do need gumption and they do need confidence and assertiveness. That's very different than arrogance. And we have dealt with both and really do see exactly the two points you're making. Not to pound on a point, but you can't listen, you can't sell. Like you said. Terrific. Well, please join me in thanking <coughs> number one. Jumpstart, and I've been there about 12 years uh, making investments for the firm. Uh, prior to Jumpstart, I had experience with uh, in sales and marketing, uh, business operations with uh, early stage businesses as well as large Fortune 100s as well. And early, early in my career, uh, I had the experience of starting and running a couple non-tech businesses and figuring out how to keep those wheels turning, beat payroll. Uh, not run afoul of all the taxing agencies and keep money coming in. Um, it was a lot of hard work. Good evening. I'm Lynn Ann Grease, and I hired Run from Jumpstart uh, when I worked there um, after co founding it with Ray back in 2004. Um, I currently run a pre CBNC capital fund for an organization called the Alumni Ventures Group. Uh, and prior to my uh, venture, career, which started back in 2002, uh, I was an investment banker for 18 years, part of the time with McDonald and Company uh, here in town. But yeah, just to start out at the most basic for investors who are thinking about participating in a human deal, when they write a check, what do they typically get in return? Sure, so at a, a, an early stage, Companies are usually selling one of three types of securities. They're either selling preferred stock in their company, they're either selling um, convertible notes, or offering convertible notes, or there's a relatively new security called a SAFE, which you might hear people talk about, um, which stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. Maybe share with us what you think the angel investor preference should be or how to think about what type of security best aligns with the interests of an angel. So I, I guess I would look at it this way. So it's not only the investor's uh, interest and priorities, but also the common interests of the company. So we, as an investor, you will have an interest in the business. The things that, that we tend to look at are the size of the round, the complexity of the structure, the cost of putting the financing together, and uh, a key consideration is whether it should be equity or debt, and what would that cost to get done. So if you're doing a, a half a million dollar financing or lower, um, you may want to consider convertible notes just because they're less expensive, they involve less legal work to get those deals done. Um, my preference is really to see uh, a price equity round um, but can also be very comfortable with a note that involves a cap. Uh, ultimately, they, they will be the same thing, so you're going to have the same rights, provisions, valuation protections in most cases. Uh, we'll Try this one more time. Oh, I think that ratio. Okay. Uh, then, Aaron, let's talk valuation. So, when you invest a dollar, you get a percentage of the company. Do you, as an investor, think about valuation first, last, mm -hmm. always? How important is it? Is this one going? 
So valuation um, is a really good screener, right? Because it's a single number. It's an easy thing to say yes or no to. Um, versus evaluating the management team. That's a lot more gray area. You can't really make a binary decision on that. So um, I would say I have, in my current role, standards where I just say, look, anything $8 million or less is what I'll look at in terms of um, valuation, uh, which includes uh, true valuation, like today you're pricing your round, or it includes caps, which are part of a convertible note or a state. Um, so it's important. It, it's not the end all and be all, but it can't be wildly off market either for, for me to move forward. Um, I will say one other thing to the previous point. I am in a position now where I used to do all deals that were all Northeast Ohio based, but now I'm in a position of I have the luxury of doing deals around the country. And I would say that by far and away the standard document that people are investing on right now are sick is safe. So it's 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 probably ninety percent of the deals that I see are needed by all six. Just as a follow-up there, because I think many of us in the Midwest have a, an allergy to safes, uh, or at least a, uh, a concern that there's less teeth, less governance, uh, maybe that they're in trouble. Do you, do you find that the safes are limited to a certain size round, or is it just supply and demand? The entrepreneurs have the ability to raise through a safe, so they do. I think it's the latter. I mean, I think it's. They're just easy, right? They're quick and easy, and that's sort of the way the market is going right now for these early rounds. Um, I'm investing in the rounds that are 500,000 to $2 million, um, but I see them being used in rounds a little bit higher, but not much, you know, so. So, Ram, every investor doesn't get their own deal. Right? There tends to be a lead investor. Right, so generally there is a lead investor, lead investors working to set uh, to set the investment terms, decide whether it's going to be debt or going to be equity, maybe a safe, um, figuring out valuation, figuring out protective provisions, and uh, coordinating with or collaborating with other investors. And it's very common here in Northeast Ohio that we see, and we've done a number of deals with North Coast over the years, um, where we're syndicating finances, and those will look like Jumpstart and North Coast and maybe a handful of angels to put together a, a 750,000 to maybe a $1.5 million financing. And so it's important along the way to make sure the terms as they're being established seem to be reasonable for everyone. So uh, I like to have, like to see that there's buy-in and consistency around the thinking of the terms. And we feel like we're representing the collective interests of all investors in a way that's appropriate. So, Linear, how do you think about reserving capital for your fund? And would you have a, a different view for how individual angels should think about reserving for future rounds? So I don't know um, how many of you know Scott Shane. I don't know if he's here or not. He's part of the group um, and an active angel investor. And he has a very, very strong opinion that he only goes into the C round and never reserves any capital to go into any round ever again. Um, that's, a, that's one theory, right? That's one way to do it. Um, personally, I think, and I think by the reason he does that is because he plays such a volume game, right? Like he's making so many investments in so many companies, he just figures some are gonna hit and some aren't, right? He can't be micromanaging them. I do think um, reserving cash though, cash is power, money is power, right? So if the company starts to have some trouble and it needs a future round, another round, and the new investors want to have some say in how to change things, the only way to do that is to bring in new money. So um, I personally, in my current fund that I manage, I'm reserving about 50% of the capital. I'm investing in 35 companies. I anticipate investing the remainder, the 50% that I'm reserving in only about 10 companies, right? So I'm gonna only double down in the companies that are performing well. So um, I think the, the philosophy around it is something that has to be personal to you. Um, if you want some hard numbers around that, I mean, I, I, I think it's always instructive, right? So 
the, everybody knows the Cover My Meds deal. Um, that was a very large success. So the people that invested in the seed round, who possibly never put another dollar in, got 75 times their money. The investor in seven, no, in eight years. And the investors who came in and put in the huge round of growth capital, they got 2.8 times their money. But it took two and a half years. So, um, you know, you decide. <laughs> you know, when you want to go into a company, um, if, you, if the person who put in the seed round had doubled down at the, the large round, it would have been some, you know, weighted average of those two. But still, I think that sort of shows you why Scott only goes into the really, really, really early stage rounds and figures some will win, some won't. What are the most important deal terms to you? Uh, so there's probably a number. One is protected provisions, things that give investors the rights to uh, control or restrict certain activities of the founders. So one thing we wouldn't want founders to do is decide that they want to issue more stock to themselves, to the common shareholders in a way that would be dilutive to uh, to all the equity investors or new investors, whether they're equity or debt. Uh, so we, we have, there are a number of really important protected provisions that restrict activities that really impact the capitalization table uh, and then impact the value and rights or um, liquidation rights of, of investors. Uh, being able to control and restrict their ability to borrow money, make decisions that would be um, maybe to dispose of the company without board consent, also important. Um, others, uh, I'd say those those are probably at the top of the list. Governance is certainly important, so the business being governed on the, on the behalf of all shareholders um, would be the things that would be most important for us. At the risk of taking too deep a dive, just want to go back to the safe for a moment. So I, I think what I would hear you said is with the benefit of seeing national deals, you're seeing a strong trend at our stage of investing, which we're not seeing in our region. How open do you think entrepreneurs here, how welcoming investors here should be to something like that? Or do you think we're smart to say, as long as we don't have to do those deals, we shouldn't do those deals? I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's that much of a difference, quite frankly, between a convertible note and a safe. I mean, so, you know, it's all so flipping early at this point, right, that things are going to change, right? It's all going to convert into something else at some future point in time. So as long as you feel that the advisors are high quality, that the company is meeting regularly with their advisors, that they're doing things right, that they're not, you know, um, stealing money or doing something illegal. Um, the structure in, of the actual security is, is sort of of less importance to me. Any mistakes uh, to share that you've seen come back to bite investors in terms of structuring deals and terms? tends to be not around the deal terms um, and more around the fundamentals and execution of the business. But when it is deal term, uh, deal related, uh, potentially valuations. Valuations are always a topic of discussion and debate among investors and founders. There is no exact science to valuing a business. And uh, the way we look at it is we don't want to um, depress the valuation to such a degree that we are taking advantage of founders, nor do we want to pay such a high price that when we go out to do the next financing that we find that we overpriced the first round and it's hard to get enough valuation for a company that performs really well uh, with their seed financing. Um, valuation is among the more difficult to negotiate just because it is very subjective and uh, we feel that there is a fair margin of negotiation on the value where you know, if you're within a certain range, you're not too high, you're not too low and it's reasonable and fair. Uh, but that's probably one of the primary areas where founders have a very strong opinion and investors have uh, simply put a different opinion, though one that I would say is not really um, different and lower than the founders, only because their preference is to take advantage. And I say that because if, if investors are attempting to take advantage, I think that really damages the market that we're trying to cultivate and develop here. So. 
think we have to agree that valuations can and should be set fairly. And typically that's what we see. Anything that comes back to bite. Okay, so I think one thing um, that I'd say is, or two things actually, lack of pro rata rights in a deal that you've done, um, and, and quite honestly, lack of information rights. Sometimes it's easy to overlook those terms, um, but really they're, they're super important because they're gonna come up pretty fast, right? You wanna all of a sudden start hearing what your company's doing and all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, I didn't invest enough money to meet the threshold for information rights or they just didn't give a lot at all. Um, and, and same with pro rata, you certainly wanna be invited back to the table to take your piece of the company if it does another deal. Um, and quite honestly, I've heard uh, from some folks, even with pro rata rights, if you're below a certain number, and this is only happening in a hot market, quite frankly, but if you're below a certain number, um, the new investors who are coming in are just taking pro rata rights away from people, which sounds absolutely crazy, but it's happening. So one more question, then we'll open it up to the crowd. It's, it's not unusual to have 2030 starting to raise capital at any one point in time. If you've got your hat out there as an angel investor, people will knock on your doors. An entrepreneur is raising a million dollars. How much do you think an angel should feel like they need to raise in order to even consider it? Meaning, it's not an unusual question after I'm raising a million dollars, how much have you raised so far? Zero, right? At what point do you engage, at what point do you get past the financial risk and you invest your time and energy? In, in terms of uh, capital commitment? Yes. Okay, so uh, great question because this gets back to what's the runway for the company and something that came up earlier this evening. Um, so we like to see that a company, one, has a plan and two, can fully fund that plan. Generally, generally we like to see a plan that runs 18 months when it's operating under plan and conservative under a conservative plan, which means you haven't hit, if you're in market, you haven't hit your top line, which means um, you have less cash coming in than you expected, only because you haven't performed on, uh, on the revenue side. Uh, conservative plan should run at least 12 months. And the reason is that we want to ensure that the company has time to figure out the mechanics around the go-to-market and the selling and things that aren't working to plan, fix them, and then position itself for another financing. So a long story to say, you want to make sure a company with a minimum to close has enough runway to, to achieve material um, milestones and value inflection points that will get new investors to write a check. Hard to tell what that exact amount is. I'd say it's, it's uh, specific to every company. Uh, all I can say is I wouldn't want to be the first person to meet in the Starbucks, review a plan to say, I'm in for 50K and I'm the first check to close and I don't know whether that company will raise another check. Uh, so I would always ask, how much How much are you raising? How much have you raised and committed? And look at the financials to see if the plan is fundable. Questions from the group? Yes. How, how do you uh, deal with an entrepreneur that uh, relative to valuation that uh, you're talking to them from a Midwest standpoint and he's looking to East Coast or West Coast and doing a crawl out there? How, how do you? Midwest Yeah, well, we've both we've both been through that working together. Uh, I'm sure we you know we can both answer, and I'm sure maybe have different perspectives on it. Uh, we we see that pretty you know, not not frequently, but occasionally, uh, someone who actually goes out to California and meets with VCs, and they say, "Sure, I would invest in your business at a 15 million pre, and I would give you you know three to five million." When they come back and talk to us, and we think the valuation is somewhere, uh, and maybe we're thinking about the same person, same company, went in. Um, we'd, we'd say, well, you know, real, realistically, we think you're maybe a five million dollar business, and you ought to be thinking about a, a two to three million dollar round. Um, my advice is go get that term sheet. If you can get it at fifteen, you might as well do it. Uh, that's very unusual, and uh, so we we have these conversations periodically. It uh, if they're uh, one, we don't want to overpay. I don't think that makes sense. I don't think it's good for the market. Um, we do some different valuations and we will offer our feedback, let them go think about it and decide if they want to come back and have a subsequent discussion. Yeah, I 
just to add on to that, data is key, right? I mean, you recognize already that there's a difference. You know, that, that's the first step. Um, and then you know that either because you've chatted with your friends about it or because you've actually read something that has that data in there. Um, and if the person is stubborn enough to not accept the realities of Midwest pricing, we both have access to the pitch book database that can run numbers and show you what the right numbers are for different regions. So um, there's always that. Yeah, I was just going to ask a little bit more about that. You talked about valuation. You were, you were representing uh, the, the total dollar amount. But I assume in pitch book, you've got all the metrics on valuation based on revenue, based on profit, based on equity currently in the business. And you would be looking at that and give us the market price. And that's what you're basing it upon? Can you rephrase that? I'm sorry. So how do you, when you're doing the valuation, what are you really driving the determination of valuation? Because okay, you've got so, to get multiples right. and metrics and everything that are key that can be broken down in many different ways to put some good facts and data around that for a lot of people. Yeah, well, it's all based on um, this. <laughs> so it's all really based on what's being done in the area that you are in and in the industries that you're looking at. So there are enough data points that you can indeed triangulate onto something that's a min, max, and average uh, for deals that look just like yours. Um, and so it's going to be hard because there is data. You know, it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? It's a good thing because it's going to steer you in a direction as an investor. It's a bad thing as an entrepreneur because you're not going to be able to talk your way into a different valuation. Um, but that's really what it's based on. Norms and standards in the industry. any terms that you guys have come across that sort of protect the investor where there's a large loss or 100% loss um, that they can try to sort of collect their loss on a, on a tax savings perspective, um, get a 35% return on, on their investment or something like that? Uh, well, not, not a tax attorney, so. Uh, it sounds more like an LLC situation where you're a limited liability corporation. The tax handling of the taxes are, or the losses would be different. Um, that, um, I don't mean, I mean to put you on the spot. I just didn't know if you had seen any nuanced language. Uh, well, I, you know, I haven't seen those in, in the doc, in investment documents. Um, typically, we're, do, we're investing into C Corps uh, where the the, corporate, the corporation is taxed and there's not a consideration of flow through gains or losses that go to the to the members of an LLC. Uh, I haven't, when, I, when we have seen LLCs, I don't think I've seen anything that's unique or gives different rights to, to the founders than it would to the investors. Great question. So, uh, so within our documents, we're typically asking for monthly reporting of, of financials and, and KPIs, whatever are the important metrics for the business. Um, more typical is that uh, investment documents or the the uh, the uh, investment, I guess the uh, stockholder rights will give you access to quarterly financials, quarterly and annual financials within a certain period. Uh, of time post close of the reporting period. Um, the, re the reason we like monthly is we like to see how things are occurring without waiting three months or, or maybe uh, three and a half to four months when they actually close their books for the quarter. Uh, so we, we ask for monthly uh, financials. We like to see that them prepared against plan and we like to see them prepared against prior year so we can assess the overall performance year over year. And and as well as we said we were going to do this and we came in on plan and we fell short of plan, we can very quickly identify performance. Um, KPIs is a different matter, so it really depends upon the company. The company that's in market 
uh, what we like to see, don't always get because they haven't built it, is uh, would be all the metrics related to how does a custom, how does the business go about identifying a customer, putting them into a funnel, and moving them through a funnel to close, and how are they measuring and evaluating the efficiency of all of those metrics? Because that's a primary area that most companies struggle. So we're investing very frequently, probably 80% of the companies that we're investing into, maybe more, are selling a product. Yet they really haven't refined that process, and they're, they're selling products in an environment of resource scarcity, meaning limited dollars to hire as many people as they would like, um, and probably having a lack of knowledge of really what their value proposition is, how do you communicate that, whether it's by a digital marketing campaign or an SDR who's on the phone and calling people uh, to try and set up appointments, or an account executive who's in having meetings with, with companies um, to pitch the product. So having an understanding around all of those uh, KPIs is critical to understanding how efficiently growth dollars are being spent and used to achieve value creating outcomes called revenue. Um, and, and so we are, that's an area where we work fairly closely with our companies to build out those dashboards and help them understand how to use them uh, so that we feel comfortable that uh, they have a good grasp of how they spend dollars to drive growth. And so we like to see those at least monthly, in some cases more frequently. Great. Successful startups look to follow up. Uh, in many cases, the institutional uh, capital coming in. Do you find those investors who push back on the terms uh, that you established in the early rounds, whether for safe notes or convertible notes, or do you see that they have observed those terms as they go into? So the question was, do institutional investors uh, push back on terms that were set in the angel round or do they accept them? Um, my experience is that they accept them when things are going well and they push back when things aren't going well. Very good, well please join me in thanking Linnan and Ralph. are one panel away from asking for feedback forms and having a drawing for angels and we So invite panel number three, please. Start us off with an intro. Yes, so my name's my name's Paul Hammerly. Uh, let's see, I was with the Fortune 500 for about 15 years. Worked for Heinz, Nestle, and Beecham. I was an entrepreneur for about 18 years. I started a company called Kitchen Basics of cooking stocks, still sold in supermarkets here, Heinz, Giant Eagle, et cetera. Sold it to McCormick in 2011. I've been doing angel investing since then. The first early years were on my own. I joined the Canton Impact Angel Group in 2015, and I joined North Coast two and a half years ago. So I've been an angel investor for about five, six years. I started an engine company called Novus Energy, working on gasoline engine technology. The company's still alive, but it's not active. So probably give that up at some point here. So I'm Ron Nelson. Uh, my background is I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. That's what brought me to Cleveland. Uh, my first company is Cardio Insight. Um, ran it for eight years. It's a spin-off from Case Western Reserve University. It's a non-invasive cardiac mapping technology. Sold it to Medtronic in 2015. Um, started a uh, microfinance credit scoring company called Iketa, which is thriving in Washington, D.C. And now I'm involved in my 
the start of Vital Exchange, which is a um, social network for patients, um, matching patient or caregiver to another patient or caregiver or group of patients or caregivers that have exactly the same needs. Um, so it's, a, it's the health network, a private, secure health network for patients. I'm Dan Rose, a 30-year entrepreneur, four different companies, four exits, mostly software marketing automation. Uh, two years ago was my last exit. I teach a little at BioState, the iCore methodology, for those of you who are familiar, and I've seen Paul in a lot of those sessions, uh, uh, and I'm involved with something called EOS, the General Operating System. We implement simple process procedure templates for small businesses size 10 to 250 to help improve the success of those companies, and then I'm involved with Alpine Capital and some investments with Thank you, so first question for HR. You raise capital from three companies, uh, from a lot of different investors. What are the characteristics of a good angel versus a bad angel from an entrepreneur's perspective? What makes you want to work with someone? Um, philosophy. And uh, I think the philosophy is really important, as well as you want to work with an angel that shares the vision. Like if I was, I've, I've been on both sides of the table. So the vision is really important. That you believe that the company is uh, attacking a problem that you believe needs to be solved. I think that's really, really, really important. Otherwise, you you become a bad angel because it's about the metrics of the deal rather than the impact that your that your money as an investor is going to have. We'll see with you for a moment. Most people in the room have been on boards of either larger companies, nonprofits, which may have 10, 20, 30, or what is it like, though, uh, for a small board? What do the boards do that have three or five people at a startup level? Um, so when we formed our board for Cardio Insight, I honestly, I was right out of PhD school, grad school, and I did not know what a board was. And somebody told me, you need a board. And I said, all right, let's form a board, right? So I do understand now, having been through it a few times, that the, that, that the board is your needs to be filled with individuals that can help you grow the business, that can help mentor the executive team, and that have a wide, they're your, basically your, your Sherpas, your mentors, and your sages that can help you grow the business. So take your time forming the board, and boards are as, should be as important, as important as the executive team, not, not to be, especially, when you go past the stages of that initial validation, because angel investment goes towards the initial stages, you really want the executive team to be backed by a board that can help the company scale. That's what's going to make money. That's going to. That's what's going to make the big bucks for the company. So right now, I am surrounding myself with advisors um, that can actually be potential board candidates. Chemistry is really important. Alignment and vision is really important, as well as philosophy is really important. So to me right now, a board is an incredibly strategic board. I finally understand what a board can do for a company versus, okay, we need a board, let's just assemble a bunch of people that have a, a long tenure on their resume and that's what we need a board. Because at the end of the day, that's the book of governance. They're gonna be the vision, they're gonna be that voice in your head that kind of says, well, this is how the company so Dan, you've been on a number of early stage boards. What does it look like from your perspective as far as the role, the approach? So you're familiar with duty of care, duty of loyalty. As a board member, you're responsible for um, ultimately the shareholders, right? And to maximize the value and investment that they have. But the process to do it, you're part mentor. I like this idea of being a Sherpa and a mentor and a guide for them. Um, you are a friend, you are an advisor. Oftentimes these entrepreneurs, particularly if it's their first time through, are seeing things, experiencing things they've never experienced before, they've never raised money before, they don't really understand what the expectations are. And so helping them and guiding them is half the journey. The other half is the governance component, right? And so it is holding them to task. It is a carrot and a whip both. Um, and I think there's a fine line there Depending upon the circumstances, depending upon the experience of the individuals, you'll know which side to lean into uh, at, at, at an appropriate time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, 
Paul, in most cases, I've been on a board with you. I know you've been on a, a number of boards. How involved do you like to get? How do you set the tone for how involved you can be in a company? I mean, ideally, you, you really should not be involved in the business. You should be helping to work on the business. Um, Dan touched on this public companies, governance, duty of care, duty of loyalty, um, being independent thinking. Universities become big on public boards. Um, unfortunately, small companies don't have the resources and they haven't solved all the problems they need to. So they need to lean on somebody. And a lot of times that's the board. Now, I happen to be a huge believer in advisory councils, which are separate from a board. They're, they, they don't vote, they're non-binding. The two companies I had, I went out and recruited, gave stock options to advisory council members. And I think that's that relieves some of the pressure of the board member to try to act like a coach or mentor. So um, I guess I'm giving you a, a little bit of a gray answer here. You jump in if you really feel that you need to, because ultimately any problem can be the downfall of that company and you want to help save it if you can or at least redirect it. So you're more involved than you probably would like to be. If it was an advisory council, hopefully some of the energy that's required to get that company up and going can be coming from the advisory council, not the board. Dan, from your perspective, how important is it that either you serve on a board personally for an investment you're making or that you know someone and have experience with someone on that board so it's a it's a preference um, it's not a deal killer for me but it is a strong preference and uh, I don't recall the very first slide how many investments is North Coast made now 53. 53 of those 53 how many do you not have either board representation or observation representation? less than 30 so the strong preference would be to have that representation right but it's not necessarily a deal killer um, I simply want to be informed, and if I think I can lend expertise, I'll reach out uh, as well to the executive and management team and, and offer that if uh, be available at your request. Charlie, you've gotten companies to a point where you've had independent board members. Can you talk a little bit about the role of being independent versus being an investor board member? Yeah, so I'm actually in that exact similar situation now with the microfinance there's three board members, and all three are investors in the company, including myself. And we've come to a point where we do need an independent board member that is not emotionally attached to the company. And that's really important. So that's kind of the minimum criteria. But we also are looking for someone that has immense domain networks, because we're trying to grow this in multiple global countries where um, credit scoring for people you know, uh, below the poverty line is, is the, so we need um, connections with development organizations. So that's really important to really hold out. And what I've found is that accessing networks and really going and tapping on those doors, and an advisory panel is a great way to access that talent. And people are quite generous with their time. And if you don't, if you don't ask, you won't receive. So it's really important um, like I always, like for us, we're look, we will be looking for independent, but for the vital exchange health application, it's really important that we bring in not just one, but you identify those skill sets that you need on the board that's going to help you steer the ship. And so I would, I would really advocate for a lot of independent board members because when everything's going well, everybody's happy and everyone's happy with the executive team. When things don't go well, money will always abuse the executive team. So as an investor, I can tell you I can be abusive, and as an executive team, I can tell you I've been abused as well. So it's really important that we have Which is that. more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's one vicious cycle. So it's really important that we have the voice of reason, voices of reason in the room that is really saying, all right, let's sort this out. Like, the emotions are not tied to life saving or emotions are not tied to, tied to sweat or hunger. So you're really saying, all right, let's sort this out. So it's really, really important to have an objective reasoning 
And it's really important that that voice is tied to the vision of the company. Paul, how does the board roll the ball to raise more capital, move towards an exit. How does it focus in those areas? You know, I, I'm really a novice on add-on investments, so let me push that off to the side. Talk a little bit about exits. Um, I think the thing that's unique about an exit is if you're running a company really well, everybody's aligned. The, the customer, the employee, the supplier, um, the investor, are all aligned, and hopefully that's the case in every company all the time. Not always the case, but that's the goal. When you go to exit, all that's thrown up in the air because the acquirer may not want to keep the employees, may want to replace the suppliers. So for the first time, you're possibly faced with the idea that you're not aligning everybody. And that's, it's really critical to work that through. So I think in exit, one has to start thinking about what is everybody interested in, and especially what's the acquirer interested in. And what they're interested in will a lot of times drive how you manage the exit itself. So I think the board changes. I think a follow on investment is not easy, but it's a lot easier than an exit where you want everybody to, if you care, you want everybody to do well. You want your employees to do well. You want your long-term suppliers to do well. You want customers to be taken care of. And it takes time and effort to really make sure that all of that happens when you sell the business. Dan, what do you find are the most common reasons from the board seat that companies sputter or fail? So you shared the CB Insights slide or as part of your intro. And I think many or most in this room are familiar with that slide. They've seen it. I think there's a combination of the number one, which was lack of market uh, acceptance of the product. I think fifth or sixth down the line there was effectively lack of product differentiation or the value prop itself. So those two things combined, product market fit, number one was screaming bullet almost 50% of the time. Um, in fact, I really want to see a demonstrative example of product market fit before I start to get involved. And that's an obvious thing for all of us, but I think that we can all do a better job and work harder to see that. Um, number two on that list was cash, running out of cash. Um, I personally am skeptical of that. If you have product market fit, and if you have number three, which was a good executive team, and by virtue of every good executive team, you should have a good vision and clarity of where you're going and you're in alignment with all of your different resources and your vendors and your people, et cetera, and you have a plan to execute against that. How do you run out of cash? I struggle with that. So. Uh, but I but I bootstrapped four different account times. I didn't take money outside, so I, I see things maybe just a little, little differently. But uh, those are the top three that CB Insights had said. Um, and if it's if it's not the team, not product market fit, I'm not so sure. I agree with the cash. Maybe it's some other macro uh, issue that does occur that is beyond our control. Questions from the group? <coughs> Before answering that, I just want to say that a lot of times the early stage companies have five board members. I'm just picking a number out of the air, and three of those will be from investment organizations or four. So the problem that you raise is one of the minority of the board. Um, I have found LinkedIn to be just unbelievable. I, I mean, I have found people typically, and, and I'm, I'm a little bit of an ageist here, but people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s that are retired that have really the cream of the crop of their industry. They want to contribute. They want to stay active. And I, I, I found a VP 30 years of, of Briggs and Stratton, who's in charge of, he was the president of international of Briggs and Stratton. And he was available to us, you know, 24 seven. We didn't abuse it, but we picked him out through LinkedIn. I have, a good way is to listen to podcasts in your domain of interest and contact the speakers. I've had so much luck because they always podcast in that domain, always invite the leaders in the field, and they always say, call me, here's my email, or you go to the comment section, you can find
find it and, and through LinkedIn or through their direct email. That's a great way. And you also know from their comments whether you're aligned at least at a ground level. have the choice of uh, choosing your money, choose your money. Because again, investors should not come in. Investors are as in, once the deal's done, they're sitting at the table, around the table. And if they're not aligned with the philosophy of the executive team and the founding team, where the company's going, or at least philosophically, that's an issue, right, to begin with. Um, I did, that's something that I learned because initial, initially I, I, I did it by the books. Uh, said okay, you need you, know, you need to have VC capital, and, big, and developing a medical device is very hard to bootstrap because you have to get it through the regulatory process. It's a long, long process, and therefore getting external capital. So you got to get when there's money around the table, you take it. Right? That was the philosophy, and I, I do I do not agree with that right now because I do think that it has to be it has to be a marriage, and in order to survive, you know, it has to be the the investor and the entrepreneur have to be in alignment. There has to be mutual respect, and it has to be a deal where the entrepreneur is creating value and return on investment for the investor, and the investor is respecting the entrepreneur to do the job. If that's not there, it doesn't work. And it's a constant process where you're trying to, to manage internally when you actually have a job to run the company and steer the ship. So that, that, that has to be done. That's important. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>
to feel free to leave these surveys on the table or the table on the way out. Thanks again.